Hello and welcome back to Data Driven Methods in Dynamical Systems. And today I want to talk to you about dynamic mode decomposition for continuous time systems. Now in the last two lectures we've been talking about the Koopman operator and discrete time dynamics and we saw that if our dynamics were actually discretizable, which means that they were forward invariant, maybe they had a global Lipschitz condition or something like that, that we could actually do a sort of DMD for this system where we discretize it first. But that's not really natural, and we're using the Kuban operator in a condition where it shouldn't be. Kuban operators are made for discrete time dynamical systems, not for continuous time dynamical systems. And we already know a good operator for that, and that is the Liouville operator, or sometimes the Kuban generator. Now, Liouville operators are more general than Kuban operators, where we have systems that have finite escape times which aren't discretizable. It's really simple systems like x dot is equal to 1 plus x squared, which gives us tangent, which we know blows up. What we want to do is we want to actually come up with a DMD routine that can apply to any continuous time dynamical system. And so we need to be a little bit more careful rather than say willy-nilly discretizing our dynamics. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce occupation kernels and their connection to Liouville operators, which we actually have already introduced, but we're going to tell you how they can be used as a basis that can give us a continuous time dynamic mode decomposition. And so this is work that I've been working on with Rishikesh Kamala Purkar, L. Forrest Bruce Rosenfeld, and my postdoctoral advisor, Taylor T. Johnson, uh, back when I was over at Vanderbilt, and also with Benjamin Russo and my graduate students, and we're happy to present this to you. And well, why don't we go ahead and start talking about it? So before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment to talk about some of the plans for the next few months. As far as the class goes, you know, last week was the last week of classes at my university for the spring semester. And so that ends my special topics course in data-driven methods in dynamical systems. And I don't really want to stop. So I, I've really enjoyed this format, like finding media to throw in here and and doing all this hardcore editing to compact a really big idea into maybe about 30 minutes. I know a lot of these lectures can be a bit intense and yeah, I just don't want them to take too long to get through. So I, I do chop them down quite a bit. Yeah, maybe sometimes I, I need to slow it down. For the summer, I, I'm gonna keep these lectures going. I'm gonna try to release a video about once a week, if not a little bit more if I can. Of course, I have papers and other things I need to focus on, so maybe not every week. But at the same time, I want to continue to delve into my own research and other approaches for data-driven methods in dynamical systems and even just data analysis. In addition to all this, I'm going to be teaching numerical analysis in the fall, and I'm going to be teaching differential equations. Now, if you've been on this channel for a while, you should know that I already have a playlist for numerical analysis and differential equations, but there's always more to those topics that you can go into. I will be teaching those classes live, so all of these will just be purely extras for any of my students. And so I'd like to go into uh, how to do some basic MATLAB coding. So if you're new to MATLAB and you haven't done a lot of MATLAB work in the past, you might find some of my future videos be interesting and helpful. Uh, this is in particular for people I know who know the operator theory side of things, but never really have had to implement anything in MATLAB. So this is where you start. So I really encourage you to subscribe and stay tuned. And we're going to go into a lot of really deep ideas that nobody else really seems to have realized in the field. And I'm really excited to share this with you. This is going to include things like control affine systems, fractional order systems, and all sorts of really cool things that are really, really new. So stick around and let's get back to doing dynamic mode decomposition with label operators and occupation kernels. Occupation kernels and label operators. Let's talk about how they're connected. So to start, we're on a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, and this is a space of functions that we're going to assume is continuously differentiable. And the occupation kernels represent the functional of integration after composition with some signal. In this case, we're going to be taking these signals as being trajectories from our dynamical system. And when you take a look at the Liouville operator, it turns out that the adjoint of the Liouville operator applied to the occupation kernel ends up giving you a difference of two kernel functions, each one centered at different endpoints of your trajectory. And you can see this just by taking a look at the functional where G maps to the inner product of AF, G against the occupation kernel. And then that ends up being the integral of the gradient of G composed with the trajectory from the system times F 
composed with the trajectory from the system and integrated dt. And that inner portion of that integrand ends up being the time derivative of g composed with the trajectory. And so then ultimately it just ends up being your function g evaluated at either endpoint of the trajectory by the fundamental theorem of calculus. And then g evaluated at points turns into kernel functions and there you go. You have on one side afg comma the occupation kernel and on the other side you have g comma the kernel functions. That means that the adjoint of the Liouville operator acting on the occupation kernel gives you these kernel functions. So just like I mentioned before, there are two different approaches that we can take with this whole dynamic mode decomposition. So in this context, we're gonna be given a whole bunch of trajectories from our dynamical system. Even if you start with one trajectory of a dynamical system, you can subselect snapshots and turn it into multiple trajectories. Then you're not asking anything more than what you would need from a typical DMD routine with Kuban operator. And so in this case, we have trajectories from our dynamical system, and we're gonna be looking at the occupation kernels that correspond to them. So what you could do is you could do everything using this adjoint relation on your occupation kernel to get a finite rank representation for your Lievelo operator. But in this case, and what I'm gonna to present to you here, we're gonna do it in sort of the forward direction. We're gonna use the occupation kernel basis, we're going to apply the Lievelo operator to them, and then ultimately what we're gonna do is we're gonna project back down onto this occupation kernel basis. And this is gonna end up giving us a nice finite rank representation of our dynamical system that is represented as a matrix acting on our occupation kernels. Now, before we go ahead and jump into the algorithm, why don't we talk about why we want this in the first place? So just like with the Koopman operator, we wanted eigenfunctions and eigenvalues corresponding to the Koopman operator so that we can express our state through the full state observable, which was broken down in terms of the eigenbasis that we got out of the Koopman operator. We could then replace our state with a linear combination of exponentials that model our state. And that's exactly what's gonna happen with the Lievel operator. If you end up taking an eigenfunction for the Lievel operator, then what you're gonna end up having is that if you compose that eigenfunction with a trajectory from your system, and then you take the time derivative, what you're gonna end up getting is you're gonna get the gradient of your eigenfunction evaluated at your trajectory times the time derivative of your trajectory just by a chain rule. But the time derivative of your trajectory is represented through the dynamics evaluated at your trajectory. And this is the Lievel operator applied to your eigenfunction, but then evaluated at the trajectory itself. So on one side, you have the time derivative of your eigenfunction evaluated at the trajectory, and on the right-hand side, you have lambda times your eigenfunction evaluated at the trajectory. And so then that means that the trajectory itself can be represented through an exponential function. It just becomes the eigenfunction evaluated at the trajectory at time t is equal to e to the lambda t times the eigenfunction evaluated at your trajectory at zero. So there you go. What you want to do then is you want to take your full state observable, if it is in your Hilbert space, and you want to break it down in terms of the eigenbasis of the Lievel operator, assuming that we have a full basis. And so once you do that, then you have x of t is equal to the full state observable, evaluated at x of t is equal to the sum of the, what we will call the Lievel modes times the eigenfunction evaluated at your initial point times e to lambda t. And of course we get these Lievel modes by doing this whole process one dimension at a time, which is equivalent to doing it for a vector valued reproduced kernel Hilbert space with a diagonal kernel. Okay, so just like with the Kuban operator, where we started with the kernel functions that were centered at our snapshots, and we use that at, to span a subspace where we made a compression of the Kuban operator onto that space. What we're gonna do is we're gonna do the same thing. And in this case, we're going to do it with the Lievel operator, but instead of using the kernel functions that correspond to snapshots, we're gonna take the collection of trajectories that we have, and we're gonna make occupation kernels out of them, and we're gonna make a space out of those. So we have a finite dimensional space spanned by our occupation kernels, and we're gonna take a look at the Lievel operator there. But we wanna make sure it maps back to that space, which means we need to do a projection after the fact. We are technically doing a projection before and after, but the projection beforehand doesn't do anything to the space. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply the Lievel operator to these occupation kernels, and then we're going to project them back onto the span of occupation kernels. 
And what this is going to give us here is it's going to give us a finite rank representation on the subspace spanned by these occupation kernels. And so then what we're going to do is since we're mapping from the subspace spanned by these occupation kernels and we're going back to it at the end of the day is that we're going to look for eigenfunctions. And these eigenfunctions are going to be represented as a linear combination of occupation kernels. Now, it should be noted that we are packing in one extra assumption here, and that is that the occupation kernels are actually inside the domain of the Leovil operator. If that is not the case, you can still do this with the adjoint of the Leovil operator, which always has the occupation kernels inside of its domain. So then what we're going to do is we're going to apply the Leovil operator to each one of our occupation kernels. Now, we are assuming that these occupation kernels are actually in the domain of the Leovil operator, so it is an extra assumption. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna project it back onto the span of occupation kernels. So for instance, if I take the occupation kernel for corresponding to the first trajectory, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the label operator, apply it to that, which gives me the gradient of the occupation kernel for the first trajectory, evaluate it at x times f of x. And if I'm gonna do the projection back onto these occupation kernels, what I need to do is for each occupation kernel I have is I have to take the inner product with that new mapping against each one of the other occupation kernels corresponding to trajectory one, trajectory two, up to trajectory M. And so for say trajectory I, if I take the inner product of the gradient of the occupation kernel evaluated at X times F of X, and I take the inner product with the occupation kernel corresponding to trajectory I, what I end up doing is I take the integral from zero to TI of the occupation kernel's gradient evaluated at the trajectory for I times F evaluated at the trajectory for I and DT. And what that's gonna end up giving me is it gives me the occupation kernel evaluated at the endpoint of trajectory I subtracted by the occupation kernel evaluated at the initial point for trajectory I. And there you go. That is the, the ith slot that goes into that vector of inner products that you need for the projection. And so then when you want to complete the projection for that particular mapping of the occupation kernel, what you need to do is you need to multiply by the gram matrix corresponding to the occupation kernels, or rather that gram matrix is inverse. And so then you do this for each one of your basis elements and on the right hand side where you're going to get it is your each column is going to be the inner products of each of these mappings against all the occupation kernels. And ta-da, that is the finite rank representation for the Leovil operator on the span of occupation kernels. So really easy to set up. Now, why don't we go ahead and talk about how we can actually do some computations here. Okay, so just as before, what we're gonna do is we're gonna find the eigen decomposition. Again, not every matrix is gonna be diagonalizable, but the set of diagonalizable matrices have full measure inside of the space of all matrices. So it's very unlikely we're gonna run into a case where we can't actually find an eigen decomposition. So what we're gonna end up doing then is we find an eigen decomposition. And so that's gonna give me the eigen vectors V1, V2, V3, etc. And we need to normalize these so that they correspond to proper normal eigenfunctions. So what we're going to do is we're going to take each of these vectors and we're going to divide by the square root of V transpose times the gram matrix for the occupation kernels times V. And then that will normalize each of these vectors so that when we apply them to our occupation kernels to get our eigenfunctions, well, we know that all of our eigenfunctions are now normal. So. There we go, that's the first step. Now what we need to do in order to complete this dynamic mode decomposition is we need to take the full state observable and well, the ith component of the full state observable, that one that maps a state to its ith component, we'll write this in the parentheses. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna project this onto our eigen basis. And this will give us the ith component of each of our Leovil modes. And then we're gonna stack them at the end of the day to get our full Leovil modes, which match the dimension of our system. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our full state observable or the ith component now, and we're going to project it onto this eigen basis. Remember, this isn't an orthonormal basis, so it isn't gonna break down as just being the full state observable inner product against each one of these guys as far as giving you the weights. It's a little bit more complicated than that. But but it's not that much more complicated and that we just need to do the same routine we did before where we make a gram matrix from our eigenbasis which can be obtained from the original gram matrix for the occupation kernels just by conjugating by these normalized v's and so that is our gram matrix that we're going to be inverting against the vector of our full state observable being interproducted against each of these eigenfunctions 
what we do then is we just take a look at g against each of these eigenfunctions, but each of these eigenfunctions is really in the linear combination of occupation kernels, and so we can pull out this vector v as a row vector, and then we have our full state observable evaluated at each of these occupation kernels, which is just an integral from zero to t of the ith component of that particular trajectory that corresponded to that occupation kernel. And so you just do this all the way down and then you can go ahead and multiply that by a matrix of Vs where they're all written as row vectors. And so then we end up having the inverse of this Graham matrix, which is written as say V transpose times a Graham matrix times V, this inverted times V transpose times our inner products against our occupation kernels. And then the V transpose can be pulled out to the other side using what mathematicians call the socks and shoes theorem. And that ends up canceling the other V transpose. So you end up having a nice clean representation for the weights that correspond to these Lyable modes. And so then you take these weights, and that was the weight for the ith component of our state. And so then you stack these, and then you have your full Lyable modes for your dynamical system. And so then at the end of the day, we have our dynamical system, which we'll write as x of t, is now equal to the sum from n equals zero to infinity of our eigenfunction evaluated at x0 times our Lyable mode, and this times e to the lambda t. And there you go. That is dynamic mode decomposition for a continuous time system. There are a few caveats uh, that come up computationally, and we're gonna approach that when we talk about the MATLAB application in just a moment. So right now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through and do a tour of the code. So the code here is for the continuous time dynamic mode decomposition, and we're using the occupation kernels in order to get a finite rank representation of the Leoville operator. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this finite rank representation. We're gonna take its spectral decomposition, and then we're gonna to try to rebuild our trajectories. So what we're gonna ultimately end up with is a model for our system that is a linear combination of exponentials. It's a lot like the kernel DMD code, but there's a few things that end up changing. There's a lot of integrals that end up having to happen, which means that we need to worry about things like Simpson's rule and how we're gonna do the approximation. Also, what we need to worry about is the time step. That's something we didn't have to worry about with the Kuhlman operator, it, or well, Kuhlman operator or uh, discrete time systems. So in here, we're gonna be using uh, length five trajectories because, well, they're odd. And so they fit well with the typical Simpsons rule, which comes with weights of one, four, two, four, one. And then we multiply by h over three in order to get down to an actual integral. Now, turns out that if we use a single trajectory, we can actually do a lot of clever things. So instead of doing everything like we, we did with the duffing oscillator, where we take each pair of trajectories and go ahead and compare them in order to make a gram matrix for the occupation kernels, we can actually start with just the gram matrix that we would make for the regular Koopman operator. And this would use all the snapshots for our dynamical system. And then what we do is we would just take all of these snapshots and we make them into a gram matrix. And then we just take integrals of these in, well, we take double integrals. And in order to do this, uh, what we do is we, for each inner product between two occupation kernels, we take this gram matrix and then we select those particular parts of our trajectory that are gonna be in our in the inner product for that occupation kernel, and we hit it with a row, and then on the other side we hit it with a column that represents the other, uh, the other occupation kernel. And so then what we do is we just take all these weights and we conjugate them on either side of the regular gram matrix for the uh, Koopman operator, and then for a single trajectory, what we end up getting is we have a nice and quick way of computing the occupation kernel gram matrix, which makes this ultimately take only roughly more than what it would take for the regular Kuhlman operator. So there's really no loss in computational time uh, by doing this method. Then after that, uh, we compute the, the um, interaction matrix and that again takes some manipulations of the gram matrix for regular kernels. And ultimately at the end of the day, we take the combination of the inverse of the gram matrix for the occupation kernels against our interaction matrix and 
Then we take the eigen decomposition, that gives us the eigenvectors that end up being hit against our occupation kernels, and that gives us eigenfunctions, and then we normalize those. And then what we do is we finally project the full state observable onto these occupation kernels, which really just amounts to doing a few matrix manipulations against a bunch of integrals of trajectories. It turns out actually we could even do that whole last part by solving a uh, regression problem using the Lieville modes. Well, why don't we stop talking and we can just go ahead and jump into it. So here I have pulled it up and I have the original kernel DMD code that I already sent you. The regular kernel DMD has something like uh, the grand matrix. We have a kernel in here and then the interaction matrix, what we call it, where we just shift one forward. Now the difference between the interaction matrix between the occupation kernel and the kernel DMD is that for the kernel DMD, it's only a evaluation. But with the kernel DMD, we have to integrate, take the difference of two kernel functions that we need to integrate it. And so if you come into here, what we're going to do is we're going to load the cylinder data set just like what we did before. And this comes from Nathan Kutz's and Steve Brunton's book on DMD, but it also appears in uh, the Brunton Kutz book for uh, data driven science and engineering. And so then we're selecting this U all, which is going to be the flow across the cylinder. And in their book for DMD, they say that the time steps are actually 0.02. And so, so we're including that here. Uh, so, uh, some basic things. I don't know if we actually use this anymore here, um, and this actually does matter. It's no longer discrete time. And so, uh, here, I'm just selecting a kernel. So I have two different kernels I'm comparing this with. Uh, so I'm using the occupation kernel. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm using the kernel function that is the Gaussian, which gives us occupation kernels at the end of the day. And I selected mu to be 500. We found this to actually work fairly well. Um, I can take this very, very low though. Uh, and if I was doing regular kernel method, I would probably select this value here, which is sort of the minimum pairwise distance between the two trajectories. And it it, get, it does okay, but it turns out that it you know, there's little chunks that don't quite line up with the reconstruction. And so, um, after some fiddling, we found that 500 worked, and so we stuck with that. Uh, this is, say, me and Rushi uh, going back and forth on this, and also uh, our graduate students. So, uh, so then I, I can show you how it's going to work out for the XML dot product kernel. Uh, and here we used a mu of 1,000, and the goal there is to uh, basically damp down as much as possible these really huge values that you get when you take the norm of a vector and then put it into an exponential. And so you want to sort of take the 1,000th root of that and seems to do okay. And I'll show you what happens when you use the linear kernel. It's actually really terrible. Um, but yeah, this would, yeah, so it's just bad. In any case, uh, so I may, I'm making this matrix here, which I'm gonna conjugate the actual gram matrix with. And when I do that, that's gonna give me the occupation kernel gram matrix. So we'll use the kernel gram matrix in order to make the occupation kernel gram matrix. And so here I'm using length five trajectories. And so I'm just encoding this thing with the weights that need to go on to each of these trajectories for the integration. And so I go ahead and I multiply and I shift this over each time and multiply, sorry. I add this to our matrix and then I shift it over each time. And so I put zeros before and after, and otherwise I just have this Simpsons rule vector here. And I'll just take care to multiply by h over three each time that it shows up, and in one case, h squared over nine. So we make our regular kernel function gram matrix, and this would be the matrix that we'd use in order to project onto kernel functions, just like what we did with the uh, occupation kernel method. And then what we have is we get the gram matrix for the occupation kernels immediately just by conjugating with u and u prime or u transpose. Uh, you, if you had some complex values, we would put period prime, but it's all real values. And so just taking the prime, which would usually do a conjugate, it works just fine. So I'm just gonna go ahead and to that together and then multiplying by h squared over nine and axis these double integrals. Okay. So then we do the interaction matrix where we take a look at the u for these u values and we take the, the first and the last one and that gives us these indices. And, and then basically what we do is we just take our occupation kernel gram matrix, we've done one integral and then we take the difference of those two columns. Uh, and it's pretty good. And it turns out if you have it backward, if you do it columns versus rows, I can't actually remember which one's right. One actual make it all run backwards in reconstruction, one makes it run forward. So you'll 
have a good idea if you screwed up or not. And so I had this here just to test out. Uh, here, find our eigenvectors and our eigenvalues. And then I take the gram occupation kernel matrix and I am hitting it the inverse against the interaction matrix is just a clever way of doing inverse with inversing this. If I did slash the other way, inversed by the other matrix. And then, yeah, uh, that gives me eigenvectors. I normalize them just like we talked before. So square root of these eigenvectors conjugating the gram matrix. And then I have my Lievel modes, which I get by inverting this guy against all of this. And so this is the integrals over W uh, by using this U and I multiply by H over three. So wherever I multiply by this guy, it's gonna be taking the integral of certain portions of the other matrix it's hitting. So that gives me my Lievel modes. And this is what I'm gonna to use to break down all of my state variables. And so what we can do then is we can do our initial evaluation and uh, we can hit this. So this gives us the initial value that all of our, um, this gives us our eigen basis evaluated at the initial point if we want. And if we want to avoid this and it just looks too complicated, we can actually take the pseudo inverse of Lievel modes on this uh, initial point and that actually works out pretty well too. And so I then what I get here is uh, I do my reconstruction. So basically I'm gonna take my Lievel modes, hit it against and attach each one of these initial evaluation points to my Lievel modes. And then I multiply by these exponentials. And so basically I take turn this diagonal into, I turn this eigenvalue matrix, which is just a diagonal matrix, which is zeros. I extract that diagonal, I multiply by T. And I throw that into an exponential and yeah, it ends up working. And so here, let's go ahead and take a look and see things. So when I push play, the first thing we're gonna see is we're gonna see the, um, let's just make a title here. Uh, So title, uh, we'll say Lievel modes, and then we're gonna have uh, our reconstruction. Maybe I'll do that. I'll move this down underneath. So, so this gets our reconstruction, and and we'll take a look at the original. Okay, and so we've actually seen this already, but why don't we go ahead and move it down, make it pretend like it's a surprise, maybe you haven't seen the other video yet. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and push play. So the first things we're gonna see are the Lievel modes, and I'm just gonna make them flash by a little quickly. Um, and uh, yeah, let's see it, let's see it happen. To do. Oh, that's not looking good. So we end up getting a whole bunch of little noisy bits, and I think this is using the exponential dot product kernel. And that ends up happening whenever you have li linear kernels, uh, or lin dot product kernels, that ends up happening in, this, in here. Uh, we're still gonna get really good reconstruction. So this is the original function. We're trying to get a reconstruction of this. And let's see what we have. Uh, so it's original, blah, 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 blah. And it's our reconstruction. And it looks almost identical. And so that, that's working out really well. It, it's, you get a lot of these weird noisy bits uh, when you use the exponential dot product kernel. The Gaussian actually doesn't give you that. Uh, so we can take a look at that real quick. Uh, and we see all together this took about 23 seconds. Um, my colleague uh, Rushi and I have been racing to see if we can get this faster and faster. And for a while I was winning that competition. Um, but then, uh, and so I got it down from like, you know, three to five minutes down to like 20 seconds. I was like, heck yeah. And um, and then uh, now Rushi has put together a code that can get this done in four seconds. And so uh, he's explaining a bunch of things that came out in uh, MATLAB 2021 uh, that makes this super fast. Uh, his code's harder to read, but I mean, it's undeniable, it works faster and it doesn't use, and it does it for multiple trajectories, not just one. And so, but yeah, yeah. Uh, so maybe one day I'll be able to simplify his code a little bit and then get that edge again. All right, so let's see this with the, with the Gaussian RBF. All right, so, uh, so maybe that was the same one as before. So let's take a look at uh, the exponential dot product kernel. I'm running out of time on, on the clock here, so my battery's dying. So 
Uh, okay, so you see same sort of things. Uh, basically the same modes over again, and we're we're putting all that together. And yeah, so there we go. If this was a repeat of what I saw before, then I'm just gonna cut this bit of footage. Okay, so you can see this is uh, the original again and reconstruction. Reconstruction is a little noisy, right? So th this is, um, so it's not not the greatest thing, but yeah, I mean, you, so you see that you get a little bit better results out of Gaussian RBF here than you do with the exponential dot product kernel, and, and that's fine. I mean, it still works. Um, now let's take a look at uh, the third one. Uh, so linear kernel, and this one's going to be an absolute disaster, and we'll stop here. Uh, so it, moral of the story, it looks like you get the best sort of results out of the Gaussian RBF, which is connected to the exponential dot product kernel space through conjugation, but you know, uh, it looks like it, things might work out there a little bit better, probably because you have less huge values coming out of the Gaussian RBF than you do with the exponential dot product kernel. All right, so these are Lievel modes from linear kernel, and it looks roughly the same. And so again, here's the original uh, signal, and then we're gonna look at its reconstruction afterwards. And so, um, but it, it's gonna fall really flat on its face. And so it looks kind of like it was close in the beginning, but then it just sort of distorts and gets fuzzy. So it reminds me of uh, the Mist video game where like everything starts out really good Who and the then just disintegrates into nothing. Um, don't come here to um, but Not yeah. yet. Um, uh, oh, yeah, but anyway, so uh, that's where you get um, at the missed game. I, I don't know if um, anybody remembers that, but like when you're begin? looking at the books talking to you to tell you oh. stuff, they like fade out into a, a, a fuzziness and as they're telling you what to do and you can barely hear them. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, it doesn't really matter. Anyway, so Gaussian seems to be the best route to go here. And uh, yeah, um, I think I'm going to stop here. And yeah, that, that's uh, probably the most direct way of doing dynamic mode decomposition for continuous time functions or continuous time dynamics and so this is what we're using instead of say uh, the Koopman operator in this case and uh, and this whole method here is proprietary to to my group we have a whole lot of different generalizations that will really blow away the field I uh, and and we have a bunch of them up on archive already, um, and one at a time I'll show them here over the summer and maybe into the fall and you know, and just keep this class going. It is officially over for my class. Uh, so my, my class ended last week. And so um, this is all just kudos after this point, and I, I like sharing this with everybody. And so I, I really got into a rhythm of uh, you know putting these videos together one at a time every week. And so I'll try to keep that up as much as I can. Um, might be once every two weeks or so, uh, you know, as grading happens or I need to get papers out. And but then yeah, once I get the papers out, I'll make a video on them and uh, and show you what's going. Uh, later on in summer, I'm also going to make some really basic MATLAB videos things like that for people who really want to know uh, more about how to code up MATLAB and doing things. But uh, yeah, stay tuned. We'll do some basic math. We'll do some advanced math. And uh, yeah. All right. So have a good day and I'll see you next time.